so this is Akshay Urja Board. So this was a competition as Rajan just mentioned and we were invited to participate in this. This is at Delhi. Now I'm going to run you through some uh, basics that we were taught in the School of Architecture. Something that's become a rarity nowadays. Uh, so something which, which we feel is uh, lost in today's world and, and we're seeing glass boxes emerge across this across not just India but several locations in the country uh, in this in the world so let me begin by saying this works so we started off uh, uh, with invoking the Lord and this is the Gayatri Mantra beginning with uh, what the brief was this was a 2.76 acre in the I don't know how many of you have seen the central government complex on Lodi Road prominent landmark um, probably the energy uh, the uh, PMO's office would be extremely close to this, uh, this location. Um, what they wanted was an energy efficient, renewable energy integrated building. Um, and it was net energy positive. Uh, not just a net zero building, but a net energy positive building. So before we embarked on this, uh, trying to understand what the net you know, uh, energy positive building would be, uh, we, uh, as architects, we are always, uh, our, our solutions need to be contextually relevant. It needs to belong to the place. So we first studied Delhi, the heart of India. Um, obviously, it's seen so many, so many uh, rulers in the past. They've come, uh, left their influence behind, right from in Islamic to, to the British at a later date. And then you had the, the Hindu influence. So it, it's a huge amount of richness in, in culture, diversity, and it's the power center of the country. So this left behind architecturally several landmarks, uh, the Red Fort, Humayun's tomb, the Baha'i temple, then you had the India Gate. So this was the, this was the contextual relevance for us. Um, what we had, uh, we had to, you can't, you can't afford to forget history, you're condemned to repeat it, right? So you can never afford to forget what has happened in the past, lessons learned from the past, and it has to relate to the, as I said, not just contextual geographically, but also art, music, culture, etc. So this has been the origin of, uh, you know, we paid homage to institutional architecture, which, which has emerged as students of architects. There are only two locations that typically one would visit. You know, one was Delhi and the other was the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, so for us, you know, as students, we've seen this emerge over the years and we've seen some great works probably in the latter half of the century. That's where, you know, Charles Correa and then you had Kanmin there, you had Raj, uh, uh, Raj Reval. Um, so we, we just mapped out the chronology of events starting from 1912 right up to 1995. And we said that whatever we do, whatever we would evolve, needs to kind of be a continuation of this, uh, of these set of activities, uh, so architecture. So we started with the design and, 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 and uh, we at Edifice are firm believers in, in using as much common sense as possible because that, as I said, is a rare commodity now. So if you were to st you know, stick to the principles of architecture, what was taught in the schools, and I'm not saying that we, we, we haven't made mistakes, we didn't make mistakes in the past, but our version two was post 2006, 2007, when uh, we, you know, the economy started booming since 1994, 95. We latched on to that boom. Wherever the information technology boom took us, we went along with that, did large campuses for Infosys, Wipro, TCS. Um, but then we suddenly realized that, you know, the damage that we are, we are causing to the environment, these buildings are energy guzzlers. We were doing some really large data centers. And uh, version two of Edifice was we, Thank God the subprime crisis happened. Thank God the economy tanked. Thank God the real estate boom kind of uh, completely uh, you know, vanished, which gave us time for serious introspection. And we said that whatever we do from here on, uh, from 2008 onwards, would be version two. And we extremely sensitive. And we, we said that we would not be doing projects just for the sake of doing it. We would be choosing our projects carefully. We would be working only with sensitive clients. And these are certain rules that we, you know, we, we, we kind of guidelines that we set uh, for ourselves and, and and therefore whatever we are evolving in the last seven or eight years has been sensitive we did not go in for um, um, you know we don't design for lead certifications or grower ratings every project getting out of our studio will be a minimum of gold or a minimum four star energy rating whether the client goes in for a certification or not this was this was an awakening for us a sort of an awakening for us so we said that 
and, and why this awakening when we studied architecture uh, or during that period i mean india was a land of uh, limited means right nothing was available in abundance in fact everything was ava available was in so was in short supply and therefore uh, we when we learned to live in those conditions why did we lose it all as we developed as a nation so this was a um, why i'm talking about this that that laid the foundation for our design for this place so um, the urban fabric we defined a kind of an axis important again our site was along this this axis which had the jama masjid the connaught place small deviation was the pragati maidan but the india gate and our site if you see was along that uh, axis so it was you know dotted by landmarks our site was very close to the metro railway station which i'll come later there were some great institutions if you see the daya singh college the cgo complex um very close to our site uh, walking distance not walking distance maybe a 10 minute walk would lead you to india habitat center which i'm sure a lot of the architecture students are aware of and uh, it was very close to the jawaharlal nehru stadium um so the obviously when you study a site and this was presented to the jury so what i'm presenting to you is what we had presented to the jury so we had to keep it uh, short sweet short and sweet and um, invariably our presentations are pardon me for the language are idiot proof in the sense that we show the build up um, of our design so that you can easily kind of uh, understand in that limited time frame something that we've learned in colleges as well so or we've not learned in college so we did this swot analysis what is the strength of the site the weakness of the site what opportunities it kind of led to and the threats so if you see it's an uh, it's a very uh, uh weird north south axis it's 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 the l shaped site where you have a small sliver with of the site which on the eastern side which which uh, abuts the main road otherwise the axis is from the southern side so otherwise the access this is my main road and that's the uh, subsidiary road so therefore the access was possible only from the subsidiary road the strength was it is located as i said super landmark very high visibility accessibility a uh, public transport as i told you there's a metro station very close by weakness was the north south orientation so when you have a north south orientation there's a big huge facade of your building facing the west which is where all the problems uh, come in from in terms of heat gain so the geometry was a weakness and the effective site frontage if i am designing something iconic which is the mnre headquarters i have a very small sliver of the site facing the main road so it was a challenge as architects for us to to make uh, an impact out there uh, opportunities this is probably although we have designed a lot of buildings which you know are high on the gra rating as well as the lead rating this was probably for me this was for edifice this was the first one where we were trying to showcase not just a net zero energy building but an energy positive building um there was a park on the western side which was a great thing to have because uh, i'll come to that later is how you can use landscape and greenery instead of extremely expensive equipment to to purify your air or to reduce the heat load and then there was a opportunity was the dependency on public transport um during our presentation we we went on to 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 kind of lay emphasis or put stress on the mnre authorities to reduce the parking car parking numbers because of the environment 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 impact and because of the proximity to the metro but it was uh, it was not accepted to them acceptable to them and the the biggest threat another big threat was that there was a neighboring development eastern side you see the question mark below that the building we didn't know how that building is going to be appearing and it used obviously is going to block our vision from main road second second most important threat for any building in delhi is the security threat uh, in terms of uh, terrorist bombs etc and finally the famous uh, biggest threat in delhi which is air pollution so how did we handle all this is what i'm going to show you so um as i said we kept it short and sweet and we did not show them a huge amount of data on of later on when sandarsh talks to you about the heat gain he had done simulation exercise etc but as architects we all know that sun rises in the east sets in the west goes along the southern axis and that's what we indicated from a 7 am time to 7 pm time what would be the path and how i would need to orient my building we also studied very very important in delhi uh, the winds 
although we had to block the west that's where the winds also come in from of course the winds over the uh, in the winter come over the himalayas and they are cold winds the summer winds come over the thar desert so it comes with a lot of heat um, you had the southwest monsoon which is a predominant monsoon season a uh, uh, monsoon uh, 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 rain rain winds which come from the southwest um, so all sorts of problems coming as so so that's 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 how the wind pattern so we, again you'll see later how we view so while i talked about the context the place that it belongs to it climate is also extremely important something that there was an author called kenigsberger which we studied in 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 our architecture schools another thing which is completely forgotten by many architects including us as i said prior to 2007 we made a lot of blunders mistakes as well but this was something like going uh, what for us was going back to basics and that's how this not just this architectural solution but practically all our buildings post 2007 have have a different story to tell what we also did was a, as an urban design practice you had to um, um, incorporate place making by that i mean how does how is this solution inclusive is it uh, is it is it relevant for all strata of society are there any active edges which is public interfaces are there any um, safe green elements which are incorporated because place making is all about incorporating all these elements it can't be just one isolated structure emerging out there it has to be 24 hour use although we were told that it's going to be a 10 hour building um, we firmly believe that a building uh, goes beyond its uh, actual timelines um is there connection is there permeability is there a lot of activity which makes this place great uh, belonging to that uh, to that uh, precinct um so again if you see uh, very little emphasis on codes and bylaws because you can go on and on on this but we took just the relevant codes which is plot area the far what are the setbacks needed to be considered what is the height restriction in that area and what is the maximum ground coverage allowed now in the past we used to go on and on in front of a jury about these codes um i think it's just just about if you go back to all the 10 or 15 pages that you need to refer to you will come back with these only five things which is the fir setbacks height right and uh, your ground coverage so we stuck to that um what we're going to show you now is how the building the design emerged so the first one was uh, we wanted to celebrate the frontage now the frontage is not as i said the main road is the subsidiary road uh, so we needed to have a permeable public edge now typically what happens in institutional architecture especially government buildings is um, you know you face this threat of not being able to enter as a as a as a common man as a citizen of the of the country state i need to f the building needs to be welcoming so it needs to have a public edge it can't be just gun toting guards standing out there or huge compound walls so we need to have an edge which we'll show you how we established that and this was surprisingly the the entire team at MNRE and the jury were extremely open to new ideas in terms of you know they didn't say see that threat which i talked about this uh, security and contouring as as a big risk so we we could celebrate the public edge we so that was the building foot, uh, footprint that was being established which was a a rectangle right because otherwise you have to leave side open spaces front open spaces this being the public edge we had a building which was sort of rectangle then what we did was we split the building created an atrium in the center that's the red dot see so what it did was when we kind of dissected the entire program we found that there are two distinct uh, blocks one belong to the minister and his team and one belong to the uh, the staff the bureaucrats so we kind of split that we got the thereby having a hinge at the center yeah so ah okay okay sorry so we split it then what we did was what it then did was we tilted it ever so slightly so that you get you could get more of northeast uh, orientation for this facade um and therefore what was happening is it was responding to the geometry of the site also by tilting this some amount of interest we created the entry experience here and what we did was this blue line indicates the shielding of the west now again as i said we rather than investing in technology and or what what we call as a um um 
antidote for something that you've already done wrong, we said that we'll do it right the first time around so that the engineering interventions are kept to a bare minimum. That means that I don't invest heavy amount of money on glazing, heavy amount of money on air conditioning systems. So if I can use my common sense and architecturally evolve a solution which puts lesser load on the building, that's what we do. So, so we, did, we, we made it a point that we will shield the west completely, but we'll need to, as I said, if you had studied the wind pattern earlier, I still needed to allow wind to enter that. So it co couldn't be just a great wall. So starting with the design form evolution, so what we did was on the ground floor, we said that we will incorporate all the public and semi-public zone, which is the auditorium, which is going to have a lot of outsiders. So I've, uh, I'm showing an axonometric, so I've tilted the site, north is upwards, so the building, that's, that's the hinge that I talked about. So on the ground floor, we had the public entry. This corner was a public edge, and we decided to call it the pavilion, the Urja pavilion. That, that would be um, a pedestrian pavilion. So it gave a prominent, because I to, as I told you, there was a building coming up out here. So I had to celebrate this corner. So this is our public edge. We created a pub pavilion out here. We had the public entry here. On the ground floor, we had the auditorium. That's common sense again. High traffic areas, you normally restrict it to the lower floors. Public areas, you restrict it to the lower floors. That's why the auditorium came out here and the crash in Kendriya Bandar. That's a requirement from the government that we needed to have a Kendriya Bandar there. What we also had as a huge requirement from them was the cafeteria for the entire building. Now, typically, the way we design cafeterias, we you have a choice. So either you take it right up to the rooftop so that you get a glorious space to look at, or you restrict it to the lowermost levels because there is not just food cooking, but there's garbage movement and several other things. So it's best, and it's external staff as well. The guys who come to cook, they are not part of the of the the ministry or their. So it's best to keep those areas restricted on the ground floor. Um, and then we had a requirement for guest houses for their staff, as well as classrooms and project offices. And we taken the second level of cafeteria. The cafeteria is a huge requirement, so we split it across two levels. Um, what it did also was on my rear, I could service the, you need a lot of uh, food movement, right? I mean, there'll be trucks coming in for, for three meals or two meals. So that's restricted to the side road. I'll come to the entries and exits at a later, later stage. Um, what it then did was, having restricted the public at the lower levels, we needed a vertical core to go up to the building. That would mean the staircases and the elevators. So we got that right in the center. And we had, therefore, two ancillary service cores on the western wall, which is the toilets, the staircases, the air handling units, etc. So what it did was, this immediately acted as a great wall. And, and separated my workspace from the um, from any sort of heat gain, etc. Um, so that's what it indicates: that the, the penetration of sun along with heat is restricted because of this dead wall. What we then did was now you can't just I told you about the wind, right? So I, I if I were to just put a, a great wall of China out there, you're not going to get in light. So what we did was we scooped out. So rather than leaving it as a dead wall, we kind of scooped out which then enabled me to get in some amount of wind and some amount of light into my workspace. Those happened to be my offices, which were placed vertically over the public areas, access from the course, and therefore you got an east light into the space. The top two floors were reserved for the top brass, that's your minister, your st minister of state, your senior uh, secretary, your joint secretary, all of them occupied the top floor. And then they needed two extra floors uh, for the, sorry, this was the minister, those two other floors were the extra floors that they needed for future expansion. So that explains the vertical stacking. Great views then, what happens is, although there are some great views on the western side, you, you remember I said that I blocked it. So this on top gave me two slender flow plates which enabled natural light to penetrate into my flow plate as well as um, every, even the guy who was sitting right in the, in the rear out here got great views because of the thin flow plate. So architecturally we, kind of gave them good vistas. Then what we did then, on top of this entire structure, we erected a steel structure. Because if I have to get uh, you know, energy positive, I need its um, alternative source of energy. So we're using solar panels. So we kind of created a, a roof structure over these typical flow plates, which house the solar panels. I'll come to the details later on. And then we started working on the facade. So if I have to, and we called it the build tree. 
um, we, and and it uh, sounds silly, but that's what we did. We said that rather than leaving it as a as an inanimate facade, how can I get it to live? So you will see the next few slides what we did. So the first indicates your solar roof. What we did was we oriented this facade towards the south. So that is the screen on the south with solar panels and the roof on top. Okay, so that's how we dealt with them. each facade. As I said, we wanted to make it as a step by step so that they can they could understand. So facade, sorry. So south was the way we dealt it with solar panels. Facade on the east. Now here's where we made a little bit of difference. So we obviously, since I, as I mentioned earlier, this was all fully glazed. What we did was we introduced um, first smart pot with creepers. Second was a mesh on an MS frame against the glazing. So what it does was these plants you don't need too much of uh, uh, watering. You, these are self-watering plots, uh, pots, and there are about two or three makers for this. Connected to an irrigation system, have these uh, creepers grow. What it did was, it was just a little bit of heat would also come in from the eastern side. This creeper not only does it, uh, as I said, as, as a living facade, it also, the heat ingress on the glass is limited because of the creepers growing on it. Because the creepers were constantly missed in, in mist. That's how, what our watering system was for, for the creepers. And it kind of made that facade, rather than you've seen vertical green walls, etc. This is a, a miniature version of this easy to maintain and and you know how government buildings there's always a problem of maintenance although india habitat center is a great example in fact the, some of them said how are we going to maintain it and when i told them just 200 meters away you have the india habitat center it's incredibly well maintained by the government so i said if you can do that you could maintain this as well that's how we dealt with again common sense the eastern facade on the west facade, we called it the breathing facade. We call, you get now construction materials. This was one of it and not been used in India before, but we, we actually did some limited amount of research. What you see on top is Rahul Mehrotra's building at Hyderabad, which he had done for a developer. Simple, very simple. He's just got a, the, the, the entire building is, has, is covered in papers. And how does it happen? That's your glazed, there is a catwalk. There's an MS mesh, and that's all plant growing on top of it. No, uh, no irrigation, no piping. Stuff. There are people going and watering those plants out there. So if this could happen, we thought that we will have large punctures on the western facade. You if you remember, I said there would be punctures. There would be some amount of wind, air entering. So that will enter through a green wall for us. Simple green wall, not an extensive one of those vertical green walls. This is a simple on a mesh, so that whatever air which comes from the western side a whole load of pollution can be controlled by just minimum plants and this is the time when i want you all to take down notes and find out about this gentleman called kamal mithal at paharpur business center delhi there's a ted talks uh, and you just have to type ted talks kamal mithal he was our client we were doing something very large for him in faridabad which was probably the world's greenest building Unfortunately, the project is shelved, but where he works from now, you can see it on, on TED Talks, uh, Kamal Mittal, uh, where he is actually s used the term called biophilia. Now, simple philosophy, per person, he has three plants in his office, which is about a meter tall, and his entire air uh, uh, filtration is taken care of by those plants. They release huge levels of oxygen, productivity has increased, health has increased, in Paharpur Business Center, which is in the heart of, you know, polluted Delhi. And, and if you see his uh, interview, I have seen that building perform brilliantly. And this is where, you know, you don't just have to rely on technology or, or equipment for uh, better performance of your buildings. This is just use plants. So please see this um, uh, TED Talks and, and, and how Kamal Mittal has done a wonderful job in Paharpur Business Center. And for, for all of us, I think, He's also gone on to say that even in your house, in your room, if it is air conditioned, or even if it is not air conditioned, just having three plants, typology of plants. One is, I think, an acacia palm, mother-in-law's tongue, and a normal money plant. And, and it, it just cleans up the system, generates oxygen in the night, and it's, it's a great uh, uh, room to, to kind of sleep in as well. So, so that's what we did on the western wall. Coming to the floor layouts, I mentioned to you, there's an auditorium. So we 
we did and i'm going to rush through this so that's the flow plan because obviously they needed to see architecturally how we've got evolved it predominantly there is a public entry here there is a private entry here there were some uh, critical remarks from the jury as to how can you have your service entry and the vip drop happening on the rear because we presume that the vip drop which is the minister minister of state and the secretary is going to be very rare so if they said no it, it happens quite often and and they didn't mind the the minister coming in from the front all it then left was the service entry for the auditorium as well as the kitchens if you remember so that would happen in the rear um so that's your pedestrian entry as well as your vehicle entry we wanted to demonstrate that there is hardly any criss cross between pedestrian and vehicle entry uh that would be the loop uh, for the vip drop off that was the flow plan um large auditorium drop off area the kendriya bandaria a waiting area here that's my elevator taking on top i forgot to mention this this corner is where was there was a large requirement for a technology room a, a place to show off their technology a place where uh, scientists students would come in interact and and from the road they wanted this uh, our idea was this from the road this should be seen as a space as a as a place which is which is hub of activity which is hub of research so that's why we we had done this um, um uh, triple light area yeah close to a triple light, as tall as the auditorium a uh, technology space to showcase their products their demo rooms their you know in terms of a uh, uh, touch screen and video walls etc so if a visitor were to visit no more about mnre he would come in here a blown up version of the plan um so that's the double light area on the first floor we've got the cafeteria sorry so that's that's the cafeteria on the first floor which i just mentioned second floor is again a continuation of the cafeteria and they had some large association rooms now when we dug deeper these are the areas where uh, the unions uh, uh they uh, and, and other such activity would be conducted in this association room on the other side we had taken if you remember my vertical when i was showing the the break up of a vertical we have we have a guest house out here with few rooms a landscape courtyard open to sky um and then we had the trading areas the classrooms and training areas so what when architecturally when you're designing a high rise it's best to have as many typical floors as possible and so that you restrict the atypical floors to a bare minimum so the atypical floors have been taken on the lower floors then you have typical office floors going up helps you in your planning of your air conditioning services etc so that starts the so the third floor uh is almost similar to the typical floor except that they have an open terrace above the rooms but the rest of the floors are typical so you have typical 5 6 7 8 7th and 8th are the additional floors now how did we lay it off so when we started practice nobody trusted us with architecture so we did a lot of interior design for offices and that's how we 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 grew as and it's just in the year maybe 1999 2000 is when we started getting our first building projects but from 1987 to 1999 we did a lot of interior so we know uh, so all mean almost all our architecture projects we design inside out by that i mean take the smallest workspace um, form a cluster then go on to the the enclosed spaces which are cabins meeting rooms etc and then go on to make a flow which is efficient and we belong to the bombay school of design so every square foot is important um in terms of efficiency so the national building code i i don't know whether all of you are aware it this defines that a uh, space commercial space typically you design it for 10 square meter per person which is 100 square feet per person but unfortunately what's happening is um institutional projects like these as well as uh, discerning clients will stick to the 10 square meter per person but when you go in for call centers contact centers back offices in bangalore hyderabad gurgaon you will find that they cram in about it goes as low as 6 square meter per person but the building is designed for 10 square meter per person a huge gap in terms of fire escape widths toilets numbers etc so it's um, so while we have while you some of your architects some of your engineers please also it's paramount that we study safety first before designing any space because in case of a fire emergency you will find that the fire escape widths staircases have been designed for 10 square meter per person but actually you're cramming in 6 square meter per person so as an architect designer engineer we are supposed to highlight this to the client that that you're compromising with the safety so we this unfortunately for us is close to about 
uh, 20 square meter per person because typically the government's needs, government sizing, government, it's, you follow certain norms which are, you can't argue with them. So a cabin size would mean in a, in a private enterprise, it could be 200 square feet, 150 square feet, but in the government, it's close to 1,000 square feet. So, so there is a reason behind it. We can laugh it off, but there must be some reason. It's just that I think they meet many more number of people. There's always constant interaction, space, elbow room needed, and therefore, we had to adhere to those norms. But if you see <coughs> a very typical plan, we've got the workstations which get in light, We've got the cabins which get in light. These cabins get in light. These are my western punchers where they get in light. So practically the entire office, you don't have to switch on the light for quite some time, okay? except in the winter months maybe. Something that we've learned, we've done the headquarters for, uh, for Vodafone, for a few more spaces. When we converted old in industrial mills in Bombay as workspaces, so that it, those were not light in, in mills and right, we retained this so that you get super light uh, entering your workspace. So those are lessons learned over the years. So we firmly believe that productivity in office space can be um, increased by 25 to 30 percent if you, if you just introduce biophilia, which is green plants, and natural light. Um, it's depressing to work in an artificial light for more than four hours in a day. Uh, so we also showed an option of how we could get a segregated department plan. With, if you see out here, each one uh, uh, is a department self-contained workstation, smaller cabins, larger cabins. In the other option, we showed uh, larger cabins, smaller cabins with the workspaces. This was uh, thrown out of the window. They wanted each department to be sit self-contained. So that's how it went. And then we had the ninth floor, which was the minister and minister of state. Um, I think there was a. So that was the uh, the image of the building. Um, so that's the first slide where we said this is on energy, this entire building. So we, in the Gayatri Mantra with the Sri Chakra came on top. Out here was the Urja Pavilion, which I mentioned, on the corner. So that, that's your public interface. That's your eastern fins. So if, if you see out here, we've not gone in for a, a extremely high-tech modern structure. This is contemporary architecture, but we wanted it to belong to, to Delhi. Um, so that's a distant view of the place. That's how the Urja Pavilion, and this has undergone change now, but we wanted it as a very permeable space, airy space, and therefore we've done something, and this, actually this hexagonal grid came from the map of Delhi. I'll come to that if that slide is there. That's your southern facade. So on the south, you have the public access, the VIP access, that's the technology space that I was talking about. Double light, you're going to see a lot of activity out here. The solar panels, which come, luckily we had a huge frontage. So when we calculated the angle of the sun, you could have solar panels easily on the southern facade. It's just a grid and behind that is a dead wall. Um, starting of the western wall, that's, that's the, what I forgot to mention is all those corridors on the typical floor were all drawn air conditioned. They were conditioned by means of just these filtered air coming in through the greens, which is going to be misted. So it's desert cooling in Delhi. We can easily do that. So it's kind of being all naturally ventilated. Only the work areas were air conditioned. So these served as, as filters for me, these voids. That's your western wall as you're coming along. Um, the eastern, which I talked to you about those fins and the glazing behind, that's how we were growing it. Uh, aerial view showing the roof. Um, and that's your main road, the small subsidiary road. That's the broad portion. And those are the solar panels on the roof. Um, Another angle from, from the corner this side. That's your south facade. How are you going to see it from the main road? That's the access into my workspace. That's my auditorium out here. That's your pedestrian access. Um, I think this is where we may probably need to patch in some darsh. <coughs> if you can't patch him, then I can continue on this. So I've learned a few things about how we did a simulation. And so some darsh is um, going to be joining us so what you've just seen is how we architecturally have given a solution where we are relying on natural light, um, um, wind, um, and, and done whatever we could to, you know, three principles, right? Redu reduce, reuse, and recycle. So first and foremost, we have reduced the heat load on this building architecturally.